you so much. That was nice. I appreciate that so much. How is everyone doing? Good? Me too, me too. It's nice to be able to have some uh, friendly faces. Oh, look, there we go. Okay. It's nice to be able to have some friendly faces. It's something I've taken for granted a little bit, actually. During the pandemic, when I stopped doing in-person speeches, I started to think, oh, you know, what's it like to speak to vegans again? And I realized it's really wonderful. But I actually, I realized it's really wonderful at a, at a non-vegan event that I'm speaking at. So I was invited to speak at an event called Wimbledon Book Fair. And now I got invited to that. I thought, Wimbledon Book Fair? Doesn't that sound like the most wonderful event you could ever speak at? So lovely, right? Wimbledon Books. How lovely. So I said yes, naturally. And then a few weeks before the event is due to take place, I find out, okay, I'm gonna be on a panel talking about sustainability. Sounds good. Who else is on the panel? Oh, this is interesting. There's this lady here called Jane. Who's Jane? Well, it turns out she just published a book called The Great Plant-Based Con. I thought, that's a bit strange, isn't it? A sustainability panel with someone promoting something so archaic and outdated and anti-scientific. Anyway, I went along to it, expecting for some fireworks, and to be fair, it was actually quite a fun debate, very spirited. It open up, opens up to the questions and answers. This lady puts her hand up in the air, and she says, what about the indigenous people? They can't go to the convenience store and buy their processed soy burgers. And I thought, oh. Here we go. And then someone else in the panel says, yeah, I mean, this is coming from a place of privilege, isn't it? I thought, oh. Here we go. Now the ironic thing, right? It was 18 pounds a ticket to go, okay? It's in Wimbledon. Oh my god. The most privileged place you could possibly think of is Wimbledon, isn't it? When you think of Wimbledon, you think of the tennis, which is potentially the most posh sporting event that takes place, right? Apart from maybe um, Ascot, but horse racing, of course, isn't a sport. It's animal abuse. You know, the thing about horse racing... <laughs> The thing that I always found interesting about horse racing is how people take credit for what someone else has done. <laughs> oh, I whipped an animal and made them run really fast. Thank you very much for my medal. It's like, since when was that a sport? Crazy, right? Anyway, Wimbledon, super posh. And I'm being accused of privilege in a place where it's 18 pounds a ticket to see a 45 minute sustainability panel. I couldn't believe it. But to make matters even worse, the lady who was debating against me was debating in favor of grass-fed beef. And not only just grass-fed beef, regenerative grass-fed beef. You can't even find that in supermarkets. It doesn't exist. You can't find it. I couldn't believe it. I'm being accused of privilege from someone who's advocating for food you can't even find. Isn't that absolutely outstanding? Like, wow, isn't that amazing? So, it was in that moment where I realized, oh, I miss vegans so much. <laughs> Jesus, where's the voice of reason in all this? Anyway, I needed to get that off my chest. These are pictures of me when I was uh, young. Oh. <laughs> now the reason I have these older pictures of me is because I thought that in today's presentation, if you like, I would tell you a little bit about my life. But to not make it too egoic, I'm gonna make it with a hidden message in there, something that is hopefully quite important to recognize. And so the reason I put up these images right now of me being very young from like the day I was born up until maybe five or so, is to reinforce the message that we are all who we are because of things that have happened to us in our life. Now that is potentially the most obvious and redundant statement that I could make, but it's also very important to recognize that because each and every one of us is shaped and formed by life events. And these life events start from the day that we're born. 
and they shape what we believe and what we think and how we value others and how we value ourselves. And they basically form the people that we become and currently are. And so to me, this is really important. Now, I've been spending quite a lot of time in the States and uh, I feel sorry for me too. As, uh, I don't know if preachers out there actually, I don't know if preachers out there, but I have to apologize for preacher, but uh, the States is a very strange place, right? A weird place. And the thing about it that's really interesting, I suppose, for me, from my perspective, is the way that people think and the way that people act is a little different to how we are here. People wear their hearts on their sleeves in the States, and it's not always such a good thing, but people will be very, very happy to tell you what they think and how they feel, even though sometimes what they think and how they feel can be a little bit uh, interesting. Sometimes I look at these pictures and I think, you poor, poor child. You had no idea what was to come. Look at this little kid with his little lamb toy. He had no idea that one day someone was going to tell him that eating meat's good because it gives you bloodlust. And yet, that is exactly what's happened. <laughs> okay, speaking of which, this is Vladimir. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Me. The China War. Right. When I was younger, I always said to myself, I am never ever going to Texas. There is no reason on this planet why I would ever go to Texas. And then I went vegan and started trying to talk to people who were slightly eccentric and found myself in Texas very regularly. <laughs> Turns out the reasons I never wanted to go are now the reasons why I seem to go all the time. The people. Now, Vladimir. <laughs> okay. Vladimir. I was speaking and chatting with Vladimir, and we had a very nice conversation actually. Um, we spoke a little bit off camera, he was very friendly, he was very interested. And I always think these people who sit down and talk with me have given me a part of their life. They have sat down knowing there are cameras filming them and knowing that I have the footage, and they have given me a period of their life. They've, in essence, done something incredibly helpful for me. And I always try and remember that. That when these people sit down, sometimes they say the most outrageous of things, but fundamentally, I am grateful for them for at least sitting down and giving me the time of day and listening to what I have to say. And Vladimir is no different. He did that as well. And I'm grateful to him for that. But we went on a very interesting line of communication. And what it boiled down to is Vladimir belongs to a kind of subsection of Christianity, I think like that, called Orthodox Christians maybe, and they do Lent every single year. And so for Lent, it means that for 40 days of the year, he doesn't consume any meat and dairy. And I asked him why, and he said because when we consume meat, it gives us bloodlust, and when we consume dairy, it gives us wrath. And I said, well, if that's the case, why don't you just abstain from eating it 365 days of the year? That seems like a pretty sensible thing to do. After all, why would you want bloodlust and wrath? And he said, well, we need a little bit of bloodlust. Okay. I said, Vladimir, maybe a little bit scared of you now. Are you doing Lent right now, I hope? And he said, no, no, no. And I said, let's take the conversation off a little bit. But he brought it back. And basically he said that, we need it because if we didn't have bloodlust, we would be vulnerable to our enemies, okay? And so I said, just to simplify this down, okay, just, just, let's just simplify this down. Are you saying that if the US went vegan, that would be bad because they would become too weak and then they could be invaded by China? And he paused and he said, yeah. <laughs> It's easy to goof on Vladimir, because that excuse is a very, very interesting excuse. But the reason I mention this isn't to goof on him, I actually don't really want to goof on him. The reason I mention it is because I think what he shows is something very important. Now, to me, that argument is potentially the most quintessentially American argument you could possibly think of. 
I couldn't hear that. No one would say that in Britain or in Europe in general. But in America, when I heard that, I wasn't even that surprised because to me, it symbolizes so much about Texas and so much about the US that actually, when I heard him say that, it showed something very important to me, which is that Vladimir is simply a product of the way he's been raised. His family no doubt have the same Christian values that he has, which is probably why he has those Christian values. He probably goes to church every Sunday and has this line of thinking of reinforced every time he goes there. Fundamentally, what I'm saying is that Vladimir is not a product of his own free thinking, but is moreover a product of how he's been, been raised in the environment in which he was raised. Now, sometimes people say to me, Ed, how do you stay kind of calm when you're speaking to people? You know, people say the most ridiculous things. How do you not feel angry or annoyed or irritated at people? And that's the answer. I think it's so important that when someone says something to us, we recognize where that comes from. And we don't merely see Vladimir saying something really silly and then assume that Vladimir is silly as a default of saying that thing. But instead recognize that Vladimir is merely regurgitating the information that has been fed to him his entire life. Now we're all vegans, well most of us are probably vegans in here, and if you're not vegan, well thank you for being here, and that's great, and very open-minded of you. But most of us are vegans in here. But we are vegans because of things that have happened throughout our life that have led us to this very moment. This is a picture of me when I was five. Now, it's a little bit obscured, but I'm actually wearing a Toy Story jumper. I love Toy Story. I know that's, yeah, right? It's nothing fresh or original, is it? Or edgy to like Toy Story, but I did. But one of my other favorite films was a film called Chicken Run. Right? Now, what's the best thing about Chicken Run is it's such a vegan film, right? It's so good. For those of you who haven't seen it, basically, Chicken Run is about these chickens. And these chickens are living on an egg farm. And the farmer in the background is called Mrs. Tweedy. Ooh, Mrs. Tweedy. And she has a husband called Mr. Tweedy. And Mr. Tweedy keeps trying to tell Mrs. Tweedy that the chickens are sentient and intelligent and they're trying to escape. But Mrs. Tweedy doesn't believe it. She thinks the chickens are all stupid and would never be able to do something so impressive. So instead, she wants to kill them all and turn them into a chicken pie. Anyway, long story short, spoiler, they make a break for it and they escape. And in the end, they set up a chicken sanctuary. Oh, isn't that the most lovely thing ever? So the filmmakers DreamWorks are basically made without maybe even realizing a really pro-vegan film. Now, imagine if this film was brought out today. This film was maybe 20 years old or so now. What do you think the National Farmers Union would say if Chicken Run was brought out today? I think it would go something along the lines of, DreamWorks have created an anti-farming piece of propaganda trying to assault hard-working British farmers. Well, actually, we do know what they would say because this is a still taken from a BBC Christmas advert back in 2020, I believe. And in the advert, there's this very short sequence of an animated turkey with a jumper that says, I love vegans. And at the bottom it says, less of us have been gobbled this year with pictures of plant-based Christmas dinners all around the UK. <laughs> love that. Love that. <laughs> what do you think the National Farmers Union said about this? <laughs> This will cause great frustration for those livestock farmers who feel this is further evidence that there is a wider BBC agenda against livestock farming and the rural communities in the UK. My God. Sometimes I think I'm living in a simulation and this has to be proof, right? This is too farcical to not be something you'd see in a simulation. All right. More on the National Farmers Union later. Love talking about them. Okay. <laughs> This is me, 11 years old, fishing. I used to go to Scotland quite regularly with my family. Yeah? Yes, it's not bad, not bad. That's no, beautiful in Scotland, beautiful. But one of the things that we used to do is fish, not so good. And what we used to do is go to this trout lake, or trout kind of pond place, and we'd fish for trout. 
and we would never kill the fish. We would catch them and release them, and then we would go to a shop and buy fish who had already been killed and take them home and cook them. The killing part was something that we never wanted to partake in physically ourselves. But on this particular day, I saw something which really stuck with me. I'd been fishing, and I saw this man who had a fish that was alive and was flapping and flailing and panicking, and he held them down on a block and then bludgeoned them to death with a wooden mallet. And I remember looking at this, even when I was 11 years old, and thinking, my God, like, that's awful. How could you do such a thing? Like, what sort of person would bludgeon an animal? It was just so barbaric and visceral and awful. And even at that age, it stuck with me. And even though I had been fishing, that stuck with me. Now, the reason I think this story is important is because it shows how powerful our parents are in shaping how we feel about things. Now, fishing for me was fine. I went fishing. I caught fish, I released them. I ate fish because my parents had told me that those things were acceptable things to do, but we didn't kill the fish ourselves. And so my parents had told me that that was unacceptable. And so in a moment where I'm engaging in everything that other man is doing except the bludgeoning, the one thing that my parents have told me is not acceptable, I'm disgusted at, but not all of the other things that I'm partaking in that they told me are fine. In other words, how we feel about things is shaped by those around us and what they tell us and what we then are led to believe. Kyle. I've not uploaded Kyle yet, but I will be soon. Kyle was from Texas, and this conversation happened at a place called Texas State University, which is in a place called San Marcos, which is just a little bit outside of Austin. And he sat down with me, we had a very interesting conversation. Kyle, by the way, was lovely. Really, really, he struck me in a very special way. And the reason he did that is Kyle's a hunter. And I asked him about hunting. And the first time I asked him about it, he said, well, I, did, I, didn't, I don't feel good about it. When I was a child, my parents used to take me out. I didn't feel good about it. I said, well, how did you feel? And he thought about it, and he went, well, it just kind of felt natural. I moved the conversation on a little bit, and then about five minutes later, he did something really interesting. He went back to what he had said previously, and he said, I, I just want to go back on that, because what I said, I'm not so sure is necessarily the whole picture. He says, it's never nice taking the life of an animal. It's not something I, I relish doing. And when I do it, I say a prayer. I said, well, why do you say a prayer? And he said, I, I, I don't really know. I said, well, no, use the prayer for. And he says, well, it's for me, it's not for the animal. It's not going to help the animal. I said, yeah, that's true. I said, well, why do you say a prayer for yourself then? I didn't really know. And he said, well, you know, I think that I'm a Christian and I'm going to be judged for the things that I do. And maybe I'm saying the prayer because I'm concerned perhaps about what will, what it could mean for me. And I said, well, yeah, if I may be so bold, the reason you say the prayer is to try and absolve yourself of guilt. You've been raised doing this thing with your parents, but every time you go to do it, you have to pray afterwards because of the way that it makes you feel. And he agreed with me, but he'd never thought about it before. He clearly the way he was speaking, the way he was being very methodical in his thoughts and expressions, the way he was expressing himself in a way that potentially he had never done so before, it really struck me and hopefully struck him. We spoke afterwards for a little while and he seemed uh, pretty keen to opt for plant-based foods. He says he goes into supermarkets and looks at chickens sometimes and just can't do it. And so that to me is really powerful because again it reinforces just like the story of my fishing experience does. It reinforces how we get trapped in these patterns of behavior, these cycles of repetition of the way that we've been raised to act and the way that we've been raised to see our behaviors and actions. And sometimes it just sits a little bit uncomfortable with us, but we don't necessarily reflect on the reasons why. Now I think that probably most of us who are, have gone vegan in this room probably had a moment where we were continuing to consume animal products, but there was something gnawing away at us. And I think for Kyle, 
that's been occurring for a little while. This guy. To reinforce again the power of parental guidance, so to speak, I was speaking with this gentleman at UC Berkeley, and he started off by trying to tell me that only humans matter. Non-human animals don't matter. And then a little bit later, we actually went, well, not just humans, elephants matter as well. I said, well, well why elephants? He said, I, I don't know. I said, well, you said that every species of animal doesn't deserve consideration except for humans and now elephants. So just tell me honestly, well, why is it that you think that? And he said, well, that's just the way that I've been raised. Now, he's from Kenya. And obviously, the conservation of elephants and poaching and illegal hunting of elephants is a predominant issue in Kenya. And so it makes sense for someone who's been raised in Kenya to potentially care about elephants the way that maybe many people in the world don't because of the geographical environment in which they've been raised and the cultural aspects of the area of the world that they were born. And to me, this gentleman from Kenya perfectly summarizes how we don't really think about why we have the values that we do. I don't think anyone had asked him why he cares about elephants before, because when I did, he just didn't know what to say. But isn't that interesting? When people think about their values and beliefs, well, when do we ever stop and think about those things? When do we ever say, Oh, that's why I believe the thing that I do. Or that's the rationalization behind my values and behind my behaviors. We simply don't. We just live a certain way because we always have. We become unconscious in these habits and behaviors, and we never actually stop and go, hang on a minute. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And should I be doing it? But then, every now and then, something breaks through for us. This is a picture of me taken in 2014, I believe, or 2013, actually. And I'm at an Empty the Tanks protest in London. This is taken in Leicester Square. Now, I wasn't vegan in this picture. I, I wasn't vegetarian in this picture. But I have a sign here campaigning to get whales and dolphins out of SeaWorld and out of aquariums. I actually had a jump run with lots of different pictures of whales. I love whales, who doesn't know? But I wasn't vegan in this moment. But the reason I was at this protest is because I'd seen the film called Blackfish. Now, what a film, right? Blackfish is such a good film. And I went to see it in the cinema. And Blackfish, for those of you who don't know, is all about this killer whale or an orca called Tilikum, who was in SeaWorld in, in the US. And Tilikum had killed one of the workers at SeaWorld. And so the documentary was exploring why that happened and importantly exploring why SeaWorld and other aquariums are very, very cruel. Now, I've always been fascinated with the oceans. I mean, I say fascinated, terrified of the oceans. The oceans scare me so much. The thought of the deep blue sea and everything that lives in there and everyone who lives in there always terrified me. And I remember when I was younger, there was this TV series called Walking with Dinosaurs, which was great, right? And yeah, it was yeah, so good, Walking with Dinosaurs. I loved that. But there was one episode in particular which focused on this oceanic dinosaur. I, I can't remember the name, but they were terrifying. Say that again? My Pleuridon. That's the one, my Pleuridon. I'm running a little dinosaur expert here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they were scary back in the day when they were roaming our oceans. And I used to watch this episode and always be terrified. And then as I grew, old, grew older, I started watching shark films. Obviously, Jaws was one of the big ones that I used to watch. I used to love watching Jaws. I still do. It's a fantastically made film. And it's also about a shark, which is scary. But let's hold on to that moment. Just We'll come back to that thought in just a second. But I watched Jaws because it was about the deep blue sea and a monster living within it who wanted to kill people. And then, after I watched Jaws, I came across this film, Orca, the Killer Whale. Jaws with heart. <laughs> it's a weird one, that. But actually, to be fair, the premise of the film is that a fisherman has killed this orca's pregnant mate. 
And so this orca decides to exact revenge on the fisherman who's killed their pregnant mates, who killed their baby and also their mates as well. And so there is a little bit of a message in there. But anyway, I watched this film because I thought, great, another oceanic predator who can scare me. Brilliant. I'd never really considered orcas. And then I found out about Blackfish. And Blackfish was a documentary about a real killer whale who had killed someone. Wow, that sounds right up my street. That would be terrifying to watch. And there'll be all these creepy underwater clips of killer whales and all the horrible things they do as oceanic predators. Wow, that will scare me. And it did scare me, but not for the reasons I expected. It scared me because I realized that what we do to these animals is absolutely horrific. And not only that, but my preconceptions of these animals was completely wrong. I'd built them up in my head as being these predators who I should be fearful of, when actually they should be fearful of us, not the other way around. Now I said that I like the film Jaws. I think it's okay to like a film like Jaws if we can detach from the reality of the film being fiction and great white sharks being nothing like Jaws. But the problem is the representations of animals that we see actually impacts and influences how we perceive them and what we believe them to be like. Fundamentally, one of the most important ways that we justify what we do to animals is by giving them characteristics and traits that makes what we do to them seem not as bad as it actually is. We assign them certain things so that what we do to them can be made more permissible because of the traits that we've assigned to them. So take sharks, for example. Jaws has scared millions of people, and it told millions of people that great white sharks are animals to be scared of. And so with that idea in mind, the fact that we kill 100 million sharks every single year for fins or as a result of bycatch from the fishing industry becomes a little bit less severe when we tell ourselves that these are bloodthirsty, hungry killers that would take us out at any opportunity that they actually have. But in reality, they kill an average of about six people every year, and mostly because they mistake us for being seals or prey, not because they want to kill us when they see us. But those representations of animals are so powerful in shaping the way that we then justify what we do to them. And this is, of course, very true for farmed animals as well. This is ID. Lovely ID. Look at those eyes. He was lovely. Such a nice man. And actually, ID is now vegan, so big up ID. <laughs> UC Berkeley. He sits down with me very open-minded straight away, super friendly, super kind, listening, engaging, responding, being honest, but also taking on board the things that I say. And there was a really interesting moment in the conversation where he said to me, yeah, but chickens, can they even feel content? Do they actually have the ability to experience emotions like we can? And he basically said that they don't. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, I don't know that. Isn't that interesting? We think about certain characteristics that belong to animals, but when we're asked to think about why we think the things that we do, we don't really know the answers for that. I had this really uh, funny conversation. This guy sits down with me and uh, he starts naming nutrients, choline, vitamin K2, I think. And I'm responding to him, and I'm responding to him, and I said, look, how, how do you know this? Like, where is this information coming from? And he's like, well, I just looked it up before I sat down with you. <laughs> I'm very thorough, I must admit, well done. I love it, he like sees me, and he's going, right, this vegan, let's get some MTV and stuff, like, nutrients vegans are deficient in, this will do it, brilliant. <laughs> and I said, well, where, where do you get this information from? And he said, websites. Oh, websites. Okay. Well, what websites are they? Oh, uh, just a bunch of them. Oh, okay, okay. Can, do you want to tell me what these websites are? No, no, okay, fair enough, fair enough. The thing is, we never really think too deeply about where we got our information from. 
And the problem is we are bombarded with so much information every single day that we just don't simply fact check anything anymore. We seem to have lost the art of critical thinking at times. And ID was a perfect representation of that. He had all of these ideas about chickens, but he had no substantive evidence to be able to justify why he thought the way that he did. Ah, Martin Kennedy, my old friend. Martin Kennedy he is the president of the Scottish branch of the National Farmers Union. Boom. No. Boom. Part of the reason why we think the things we do about animals and farming is because we are constantly bombarded with lies and manipulative propaganda that is seeking to try and convince us that we shouldn't be worried about what happens to animals. Martin Kennedy. I debated Martin Kennedy on Scottish television and uh, it was a very interesting debate. And I went on this little speech, if you like, where I was talking about the fact that we gas pigs to death in gas chambers, that we house chickens in barns so tightly that they never see the outside, and because of the way they've been selectively bred, their organs fail and they die in the farms. In fact, a report was released yesterday that says one million chickens die on farms every single week in this country. Those aren't even the ones who make it to the slaughterhouse. Just because of the way they've been bred and the way they're housed and farmed, one million a week on farms. And the most tragic thing about all of this is these farmers go around these barns and find them and wring their necks by swinging them around or they stomp on them. I mean, Jesus. Martin Kennedy. He goes, because the lady who was presenting it, who actually was pretty good, she says, uh, well, Martin, what Ed's describing sounds absolutely horrific. And he goes, it is horrific. But what Ed's describing, that doesn't happen here. That happens in other countries around the world, but it doesn't happen here. And I said, I can't believe that the president of the National Farmers Union has just lied on television and has told people these things don't happen here. These are government legislated standard practices that are well documented as happening in this country. And then he backtracked. He said, no, 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 no. I didn't say that they don't happen in this country. I was trying to say that they're not as bad as you're making them out to be. But the thing is, if I hadn't called him out on that, the viewers would have thought, oh, that doesn't happen here. Because that's what we're told all of the time. And so it's no wonder we have these preconceptions of farming and of animals and how we perceive them to be. Because this is the line of information or the, the propagator of information that most people in society have had historically telling us what happens on farms. But that wasn't my first foray into the National Farmers Union. This gentleman down here, Guy Smith. Now, Guy Smith used to be the deputy president of the national branch of the National Farmers Union, so the, the big, powerful branch of the National Farmers Union. This guy, second in command. And this headline is about a farm that he co-owns. Cows sexually abused, hit and punched at company owned by National Farmers Union Deputy President Footage Shows. Now, this investigation was released by Surge, the, the organization I co direct and co founded. And. <laughs> the second most senior man at that time in the most powerful farming organization in the UK. How often are we told that it's just bad apples, right? It's not a bad apple. The whole tree is rotten from the roots up. And this perfectly illustrates it. We have the president of the Scottish National Farmers Union telling us that these things don't happen here. Meanwhile, a farm owned by the second most powerful farming man in the most powerful farming organization in the UK is exposed for breaching welfare guidelines and for abusing cows in illegal and legal ways as well. He just couldn't make it up. Well, it gets a little bit more interesting. Guy Smith 
stopped working for the National Farmers Union shortly after. He was actually voted out by the members and he got a new job. Who do you think his next job was? It was Red Tractor. Jesus, right? For those of you who don't know, Red Tractor is the biggest welfare guidance company organization in the UK. It's on every little pack of meat, dairy, and eggs we buy, you'll see a Red Tractor logo. And it's supposed to tell us that the welfare of these animals is to the highest standard it can possibly be. They hired a man whose farm had been exposed for breaching the very guidelines that they set, and they knew it. How does this make any sense? It's like they're almost laughing at us at this point. This is what the farm said as a, as a response to the expose. Do you think they worried about the animals? No. Trespassers entered our farm unlawfully and secretly filmed many hours of footage. We regard this as a gross breach of privacy and absolutely contend it. Oh, ooh, imagine that. Nothing was illegal, by the way. It was all perfectly legal. Imagine that. People come onto a farm and expose you for doing illegal things and for abusing animals. People are outraged about it. People are upset. And you try and blame the people who filmed it, not the people who did it. Can you imagine that? A gross breach of privacy. Well, it's a gross breach of the most basic moral standards to exploit and harm animals for profit. And you know what? I think these farmers can take that gross breach of privacy and shove it where the sun doesn't shine. Which... because they're dairy farmers, they're already very good at it. <laughs> okay. Flash forward. The 14th of May, 2014. So I've gone to a few empty the tanks protests. I'm starting to dabble in animal rights protesting, but I'm not vegan and I'm not vegetarian. I'm just caring about cetaceans at this very moment in time. And then I come across this story. Hundreds of chickens killed in M62 lorry crash. Now, this took my eye. It caught me by surprise, and I, I read the story. And the story was about these this truck of chickens, about six and a half thousand or so, who were on the way to a slaughterhouse to be slaughtered, and the truck had overturned on a motorway, and it had made the news. And isn't that funny? We slaughter, what, millions of chickens every single day in the UK? But then, a truck tra crashes and kills hundreds, and that makes the news. It's funny, isn't it? It's like going, hey, oh my god, did you hear about those chickens who died? And so it's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, they, they were killed in a slaughterhouse. Ugh. <laughs> Vegans, you're so extreme. No, sorry, sorry. I meant that they were killed on the way to the slaughterhouse, on the side of the road. Oh my god, those poor chickens. <laughs> Oh, God, what somebody think of the chickens. <laughs> but funnily enough, that was me. That was literally the conversation that I had with myself at that, at that time. We'll come back to that in just a moment. I saw this post on Reddit the other day. It took me by surprise. It's in a, a subreddit called Made Me Smile. And it says, firefighters are amazing people. Last week, we received a strange call, this is from the firefighters, but we were happy to be of service. This truck driver's truck broke, broke down in Moberly while on his way to Iowa and was loaded with pigs. Due to the truck being broken down, he was unable to keep the pigs cool and was afraid they would die without some help. We happily agreed to spray down the pigs to keep them cool. Not long later, they were up and running and on their way to Iowa. It was an odd ask, but we are always here to lend a hand. Oh my God. The cognitive distance on this is absolutely surreal, isn't it? And it reminds me actually of this thing that happened, I think back in 2015 or 2016, and it happened in Canada. 
and there was this activist, a lady called Anita Crank, and she was going to a slaughterhouse in Toronto on a hot day, and there was a truck of pigs parked outside the slaughterhouse. And so she, with her water, went and gave some water to the pigs in the tank. Do you think that that made it onto Made Me Smile? Vegans are amazing people. No, she was arrested and she was threatened with 10 years in prison. There was even a trial. She, she was you know, thankfully found not guilty, but the fact that it went to a trial and she was threatened with 10 years for giving water to pigs, whilst all of a sudden firefighters are amazing people for giving water to pigs. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but something just doesn't add up here. Because the situation's exactly the same. Pigs dehydrated on a hot day, going to a slaughterhouse. The act of providing water is exactly the same. It's just the only difference is firefighters and a vegan activist. Doesn't it just make you realize that maybe society's standards are a little bit illogical and inconsistent? Like how, you know, on a day like today, for example, if someone left a puppy in a car, you would be a hero if you broke the window and saved the puppy. But if you went into a farm this afternoon and rescued a piglet who was dying from heat stroke, you'd be regarded as a criminal. Hmm. This doesn't quite make sense, does it? Something's just uh, not adding up. Back to the chicken truck crash. These two, Emma and Louise, are fantastic people. Yeah, fantastic. So they run a dog rehoming center near Manchester called Dogs for Rescue, and they do amazing work rehoming dogs, absolutely. And actually, on the day of that crash in 2014, the crash happened right outside of their dog rescue center. And they helped rescue 3,000 of the chickens who were involved in that crash. They brought them all into their dog rescue and onto their land, and then rehomed them out to people. Isn't that amazing? So I just thought it was important to mention the work of these two people. But at the same time as they were doing that, I was reading the story. Now, at that time in my life, I was a big fan of Domino's and KFC. This is a picture of me, proudly, with my Texas barbecue chicken pizza. Um, there was a picture of me with a KFC bag, but it was just so weird. So I decided I couldn't include it. This is as weird as it'll get. Um, I had my marine animals jumper on, because I care about animals, clearly. <laughs> funnily enough. But anyway, I loved Domino's, but I also loved KFC. Now, KFC was my favorite food back then, and I loved fried chicken. And I'd go to my local KFC so often that the workers there would be like, oh, it's you again, you're Ed. And I'd be like, yeah, that's right. Um, Zinger box meal, please, pronto. And so that happened a lot. But I was reading this story about what was happening to these chickens, and it started to feel empathy for chickens which I'd never felt before. Because I was like Idine, the lovely man from UC Berkeley, who said that, do chickens even feel anything? That was me. That's what I used to think. I'm chickens, they're stupid, right? Everyone knows chickens are stupid. Because that's what we've been told. Well, they're actually incredibly intelligent animals. And they're wonderful, and their personalities are so vibrant. But before we're vegan, we don't really think of chickens in such a big way, I suppose. So I was like Idine in this moment, but then I read about the story and something happened. I was forced to confront the fact, the fact that what I believed was actually not true. I read that story, felt empathy for chickens, and then was forced to evaluate the fact that actually chickens do deserve moral consideration and they do feel and do suffer. And that is what led me to vegetarianism. Boom. First thing. <laughs> Now this receipt, even though this was purchased or this receipt was given to me before even the vegetarian story, this receipt right here symbolizes something really important to me because it symbolizes the purchasing of a Syrian hamster. Now, you can't see it's too blurry, but this Syrian hamster costs 10 pounds. 10 pounds for a life, right? It's such a small amount of money for someone their entire existence and their bodies and their 
life and their world for 10 pounds. Anyway, I bought Rupert the Hamster for 10 pounds. There he is. Hey. <laughs> and nibbling on a grape. Rupert the Hamster was probably the first companion animal I ever really had. I was raised with some fish, but I was very, very young, so it didn't really have an impact on me in such a profound way. But Rupert the Hamster did. I, I was never really around animals growing up. And then when I got Rupert, he was the first animal that I ever really formed any kind of connection with. He was the first animal who I actually started to appreciate in terms of their personality and their likes and dislikes and the things that made them the individuals that they are. But what I always think that is super interesting about that is if I'd gone into pets at home and bought another hamster, the receipt would say the same thing. Syrian hamster, 10 pounds. But the hamster in my life wouldn't have been Rupert. I may have called them Rupert, but they wouldn't have been Rupert. Because Rupert wasn't just a name, Rupert was this hamster with all the personality traits that he as an individual had. Now, the final piece I suppose in, in, in my journey to veganism was watching a documentary called Earthlings, hence the name Earthling X actually, it was taken from that um, because it changed my life. Now I'd been putting off watching it for a long time. And even as a vegetarian, I was under the impression that vegans are these militant extremists. Even as a vegetarian, I thought that. I mean, sometimes vegetarians can be the most regressive when it comes to veganism. Not always, but sometimes. Now, actually, I was quite regressive in my attitudes towards veganism when I was a vegetarian. I thought that they had no sense of humor and were just these, I don't know, attention-seeking people that had to take everything too far. And then I watched Earthlings. <laughs> And I realized actually that isn't the case at all. And it also showed me something else that's really powerful. After the film had finished, I sat with Rupert, got him out, he sat on my hand, and I gave him some broccoli. Now, broccoli was Rupert the hamster's favorite food in the world, right? If you gave him broccoli, happy hamster. Right? He would look at you and he'd be like, oh my god. But if you gave him kale, ooh, he'd look at you and think, what are you doing? <laughs> kale? What? Sometimes I feel that way. Broccoli is definitely the best. <laughs> Divisive, I know, I know. Yeah, pick up, pick up broccoli, that's for sure. <laughs> it's a weird one to clap about, I'll give you that much. <laughs> Rupert loved broccoli. And so I've given him some broccoli, and he's eating that broccoli, and I start to think a little bit more about him. And I start to realize that he is an individual with likes and dislikes. So things that make him Rupert the Hamster. Now Rupert the Hamster was also a very lazy hamster. <laughs> I got him a wheel. Because when you think of a hamster, the first thing you think of is a wheel, a hamster wheel. They're like iconic, aren't they? Hamsters run in wheels. Or so I thought. I bought Rupert the Hamster a wheel. He went in it once. <laughs> Never went on it again. Like my experience on treadmills, incidentally. <laughs> we have that in common. So I bought him a ball, because the balls you put on the floor and they run around the apartment. It was a see-through ball. I thought, this will be lovely. I'll get to see Rupert pottering around. I put him in the ball, and the only thing I get to see him do is sit there take all the food from his cheeks, eat it, and then go to sleep. Now, Rupert the hamster lived for over three years, which is pretty impressive for a hamster, but even more impressive when you realize he had no cardiovascular health at all. <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> so having these little idiosyncratic behaviors, looking at him in that moment, I was forced to reconcile with something very important, which is that the issue of what we do to animals is not simply about meat, dairy, and eggs. You know, we go, oh, okay, the problem is the foods. The food is a part of the problem. The clothing is a part of the problem. The testing is a part of the problem. But really, fundamentally, the issue is not found within these things. These things are symptoms of the problem. The problem is our mindset, because it's our mindset that allows us to do all of the things that we do. 
It's our mindset of viewing animals as having such little worth that throwing them into a gas chamber to kill them all of a sudden becomes a fine thing to do. The mindset is the issue that holds us back. But the mindset is the thing that's been given to us since the day that we were born. And that's why it's hard to challenge people on these beliefs and behaviors. That's why something that should be so painfully obvious to anyone who is even just remotely a bit compassionate or rational becomes an absolute mountain to climb with certain people. Because we think that someone should just hear the information and change, but fundamentally we're challenging the very thing that drives their behaviors every single day in every single way, their identity, their ego, and their mindset. And these things can be so hard for us to challenge and can be so hard for us to actually address. This is a quote from James Baldwin, who was a, an author, a journalist, and also a civil rights activist in the US. The world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change the world. I like that quote. And the reason I like that quote is because it reinforces something really important to me. But we often as vegans, and especially those of us who speak about veganism and talk to friends and family or engage in activism events, whatever it may be, we sometimes feel like we have this huge task on our hands where the person we're having a conversation with has to go vegan then. Because if they don't, then we've let the animals down. We've let veganism down, we've let all the other people around us down who are vegan as well, and who want a vegan world. We place a huge burden on our shoulders to achieve something that often is going to be insurmountable in that moment. And the reason that I wanted to tell you about all these different things in my life that have led me to this moment is to show that actually what we're forming is a massive puzzle. Our life and our story within our life is a puzzle that we're adding pieces to every single day. And from the moment we're born, the first piece of that puzzle is laid. And what that puzzle will look like in the future, we don't know yet. But what we can do is help people place pieces of their own puzzle down every single day. Because the reason that we're all here today is because of a series of events that has taken place throughout our life. Now we may think there was a catalyst moment, this one significant thing for me watching Earthlings, maybe for you it was a conversation or a, a video you watched online, whatever it may be. We sometimes think of that one thing and say, that's what made me go vegan. But actually our stories are a lot more complex than that. And all of these things that happen at every step of the way lead us up to being the people that we are in the moment where we watch Earthlings, or where we watch that video on YouTube, or we have that conversation with a friend or family or whoever, family member or whoever it may be. All of these things create the puzzle. And to me, that's what this quote is saying. We're changing mindsets. We're changing people's mentalities. We're changing the very things that have created the person that that individual is in that very moment. And so thinking that we have to shift their entire paradigm in that one moment places often an unfair expectation on ourselves. Instead, what we should seek to be is that person who alters even by a millimeter the way people look at reality. We can be the blackfish moment in someone's life. We can be the Rupert the hamster moment in someone's life. We can be the any moment that has created the individuals that we all are, which right now and into the future as well, are these vegan individuals. And so it can be hard. It can be so hard. It can be hard because we're up against people like Martin Kennedy and Guy Smith and the National Farmers Union and Red Tractor and all of this propaganda that's been fed to us for decades. It can be hard 
because we try and ask for help from people who we would expect to want to help us in this movement, and they don't. It can be hard because we expect people in positions of authority, in businesses, and in governments, and in NGOs and nonprofits. We expect them to do what they should be doing, which is give a damn about serious issues and actually follow the science and our moral intuition, and yet they don't. And that can be so hard for us to bear every single day because in many ways that's a huge weight that we place on our shoulders because if they're not going to do it, well we say someone's got to do it. And if it's not going to be them, then it has to be us. And there is some truth and veracity to that belief. But the problem is we sometimes then place this burden on our shoulders to do something that can be hard. And that can lead us to feeling burnt out or worn down or upset or hopeless. Back in 2017 or 2018, 2018 I believe, my grandparents had a wedding anniversary. It was their 60th wedding anniversary, which by any standards is pretty amazing, right? That's pretty amazing. They're lovely people. And they've been married for 60 years. Very good. In love for 60 years. Beautiful. Fantastic. So they want to bring everyone together to have a big family get together, which makes sense. Let's all celebrate together. But the only issue is I was the only vegan who was going to be there. And uh, the vegan menu they sent me was, well, left a lot to be desired. The, uh, the dessert was fruit salad. And that was the best course. <laughs> kind of says it all, doesn't it? And so I was stuck in this kind of situation. It's almost like walking a tightrope, right? Where I had to think to myself, well, what do I do here? Do I go, smile, look happy, congratulate everyone as they're all tucking into dead pigs and dead chickens and dead cows? consuming their secretions, their exploited body parts? Or do I take some sort of ethical stand and say, I'm not going to partake in this? And I thought about it a lot, and there seemed to be no good answer to this question. On the one hand, I could betray my morals and smile through the pain of seeing a loved one doing something to what remains of an animal who was tortured and killed for them. Or I could be that awkward vegan who was militant and extreme and dogmatic and upset my grandparents on that special day of love. And in the end, I, I, I went to went for the option of being the extreme and militant and dogmatic vegan. <laughs> um, it's funny that you clap at that, because that makes me feel guilty in a way. Because I've reflected on that a lot, and I have no idea if that was the right thing to do or not. And this is what I mean by the tightrope that we walk. We always have to make these decisions. How should we be? Should we be that vegan? Should we say this? Should we say that? And there just never seems to be a good answer in that moment, because what is right is not always what is easy. And what is right might not always be what's so straightforward. Maybe sometimes it's not a good idea to cause an argument. Maybe sometimes it's not a good idea to upset your grandparents on their 60th wedding anniversary to make an ethical stance. But we just can't ever know what to do. And that's why veganism can be so hard. Because not only have we got to take this burden that lies on our shoulders of knowing the reality of what is happening, but then we're, we're then expected to walk an impossible tightrope of achieving two things at the same time, being amicable and being full of integrity. And that is really good. So that's why I wanted to end with this quote. Because however bad it can seem, however hard it can feel, because we're going to leave vegan camp out tomorrow morning, and we enter back into a world where every stall isn't serving delicious vegan food, and every person here isn't celebrating something that should not even need to be celebrated. God, no offense to the organizers, but I can't wait for a day when we don't have vegan camp out, right? <laughs> because every camp out is a vegan camp out.
But ultimately, like the tectonic plates that form our planet, the shift towards veganism is going to be created by movement of millimeters. But each millimeter is significant, and we should never doubt the power that we have in shifting conversations and people's mindsets millimeter by millimeter. All right, guys. Thank you for listening.